Well, good morning, and thank you, moms. Happy Mother's Day. Hope that you're able to celebrate uh, with everyone today. Hope it's a wonderful day for you. Again, when we honor moms, we honor the God who made the moms. We honor all those things about mom that remind us of the love and grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. So happy Mother's Day, and welcome to worship here online with us, our online worshiping community. So glad you can make it. I'm Jason Tucker, a senior pastor here at Tower Hill Church. And if it's your first time with us here online, a very special welcome to you. Pray that you feel right at home. Well, we're starting a new sermon series today, which is after this kind of post-resurrection series we did after Easter about all the reasons why Jesus continued to meet with his disciples and why he was trying to teach us how to live by faith and not by sight. Well, what does that mean for us? I think the logical next question is, what's my next move? What's your next move? You see, it's one thing to just sort of go through the mental process of thinking about faith and the resurrection and what that means. It's quite another thing to actually put that into action, into steps, into things that we can apply to our everyday life. So that's the goal of this sermon series, is to try to get you to a point where you can take some action toward your relationship with God. Action toward where you think God is calling you next. How do you find out where he's calling you and how do you start following? That's what this series is all about. So as we go along, every single week, there are gonna be downloads available on our website for you to do some follow-up exercises. And I hope you'll take us up on it because I think it really matters. It's in the doing that most of the learning really happens. Uh, Our life of faith is really an apprenticeship, right? We learn by doing. So your next move, let's talk about it. Because for most of us, we're wondering, what is it that God wants for me right now? Not from me, but for me. What is God put in front of me and says, come here, I want you to do this now. What is that thing that he is calling each of us toward? He's always calling us to something. What is that thing? And how do you find out what that thing is? And there is nothing that feels better in life than knowing you're right where God wants you. But the problem is there are a lot of things that get in the way of that. Case in point, every Sunday morning, my ritual before I come to church is to go get coffee in Red Bank. It is a favorite ritual of mine. I got a very specific way that I do it. So if you ever go to that Starbucks, right, on uh, Broad Street there, and uh, and you get the 15-minute parking, like, you know you've won the lottery. Like, that's just... It's the greatest. And that hour on Sunday morning is perfect. It's like right in front, and it's my ritual every Sunday. But then this Sunday, something happened that I forgot about. Red Bank had put these big concrete barriers to block off the streets. They do it for outdoor dining, which, by the way, is awesome, and I'm a total fan of. I'm not complaining about that. But the thing is, I forgot that the barriers were going to be there. And then what was a very simple drop by, pick up my coffee, and go turned into this whole roundabout drive to get to where I needed to go. And very limited parking options. Then I had to go, and God forbid, I had to walk to the Starbucks and get my coffee and go back. It was so much more complicated than it had to be. And then I started thinking to myself, that's kind of like my spiritual life sometimes. Maybe you could relate to that. Where instead of barriers that God puts in front of us, they're barriers that we put up. And we make it so much harder to follow. We put all certain criteria on what it means to follow Jesus, and it slows us down. It makes this, what could be a lot cleaner and simple, it makes it really circuitous and really messy and take longer. So how do you plan for that? How do you make sure that you're able to kind of clearly listen and clearly follow? This is actually, this is a process, an ancient process that, that we believe that Christians, it's one thing to have salvation and to you know, be with God forever. It's another thing, then, what does that mean for your everyday life? And there's this great theological word for it. We call it spiritual formation, but the theological word is sanctification, which means the process of being made holy. The idea is, is that we are a people in process, and that process is leading us to greater and greater Christ-likeness. That should be the goal of every Christian, that we engage in this process, and throughout our lives, both here on earth and then into eternity, we grow more and more 
like Jesus. That's the process of sanctification, making holy. Again, we call it spiritual formation because I think if you start talking about sanctification, people might get confused. Spiritual formation. And it's a, what is this but a process of removing the barriers so that you could become more and more like Jesus. And those barriers look like all different things in our lives, don't they? Barriers of, well, I have this career path, and therefore, wherever that leads, then if I've got room to fit God in, great. Or I've got this plan for, uh, you know, what kind of family, or what kind of housing, or what kind of uh, interests that I want to have. And, and, if it, and if God kind of weaves in and out of that plan, that's great. But if, if it's something else, I don't know. I've put up these concrete barriers, and I'm really not going to stray from this even if God wants me to. I just sure hope that God operates within my barrier system, right? And when I say it out loud and you hear it, you're like, oh yeah, that's kind of dumb. But we all do it. We all do it. So sanctification is this process of becoming more like Jesus and allowing him to remove those barriers. Uh, Derwin Gray, Dr. Derwin Gray, uh, Gray tweeted this ju- uh, just a couple of days ago that I thought was really pertinent. It said, sanctification is the undoing of things that make us less human. The undoing of things that make us less human. I think that's a really interesting idea. That if Jesus was the perfect human, we are all, uh, he's the human that we are aspiring to be. And and looking at Jesus is looking at what it means to be fully human, created in God's image, and, and to not have sin get in the way. And so therefore, our experience of humanity is less than fully human because of sin. So he's saying sanctification is getting rid of those things that make us less than fully human. It's a really interesting and I think deep idea. I love uh, the way that scripture talks about it in the Old Testament, in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, God uses this way of describing himself as a potter and Israel the clay. And there's this moment when he calls Jeremiah to come to the potter's house and he sees a potter, and, and the clay is kind of getting marred in his hands, and, and he's shaping it and, and molding it. And at one point, you know, the, the clay just sort of collapses, and he builds it up again. And God says, this is like Israel. Israel's in a bad place. But he said, can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter does, declares the Lord? Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, Israel. I love that. This idea that God's forming, and just like a potter with clay, if you've ever seen anybody make pottery, you know that the clay could get dried out, it needs to apply, you know, you need more water, you need, you need to make the clay malleable to be shaped and formed. And I think our job isn't to form ourselves, but to be malleable enough for God to do the forming. Because God's always forming us. He formed us even before we knew anything about God. I love, again, in Jeremiah, he explains to him, he says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Now, while that was an a encouragement specifically to Jeremiah, I think we could take from that that God is in the formative process with us all the time, even before we were born. And then, of course, Jeremiah, uh, he continues that thought throughout the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, where he says quite famously, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. You know, it's, it's wild, right? That this idea that God is forming us and shaping us. But I want to take sanctification and that quote, like undoing the things that make us less human. I want to put a more positive spin on it today. I like that idea a lot, but let me just, change it a little bit. I want to say this, that sanctification is doing all the things that make us more human, more like Jesus. Not the things that make us less human, the things that make us more human. In other words, it's not just about removing barriers, but what can I do proactively to help me follow in such a way that I regain the humanity that I've lost through my own sin? Again, I always like taking something that's negative and kind of making it a positive here. So let's think about that. What does that mean for us? What can we do? What can we add to regain that humanity that we have lost in the process of sin? 
I think when you start out, it, it really comes down to this. I have to believe that God's version of me is greater than my version of me. I have to trust at the most basic level that God knows better than I do about the lump of clay that needs to get formed. I need to trust in his formative process and be willing to be malleable enough to let him do it. This is spiritual formation. This is sanctification. If you want to mix metaphors here, it's sort of like if you are doing a, a home remodel, right? Your life is not a teardown but a renovation. God doesn't want to exchange you for somebody else. He wants to redeem you. He wants to help you be the person that he created you to be for his purpose, for your purpose, for your joy, for his joy. This is what he wants to do. So the question that we ask is, what's my next step? All of us, should, all of us have a next step to take, right? So this series about asking questions, what's my next step? And in this process, here are some next steps, and it begins with this. Follow. Step number one is always follow. And you might say, all right, look, I could tune out. I'll catch version two because I got that one down. I already believe in Jesus, and I'm already following him. Are you, though? Are you really? Have you allowed him to knock down the barriers that you've put up? Have you decided to follow Jesus today? Not just agree with Jesus, but follow Jesus. Have you decided to do that? I think this is really what it means to live the Christian life, is to be in a perpetual state of following. And to follow, you've got to be able to recognize Jesus, and you've got to be able to act accordingly. Here's uh, this wonderful scripture that, that talks about this, both identifying and following Jesus. This is when Jesus was baptized from uh, the Gospel of Matthew. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So many things are happening in this story and we've, we've, I've preached on this story a lot. It's the kind of thing you probably talk about every week. But one of the fundamental things that we see here is the Father identifies who the Son is. It is a moment of identity revealing. This is Jesus, my Son, with whom I am well pleased. So now we continue to the Gospel of John, where it says, The next day John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. What's wild to me is you see this chain of events where you start to see a pattern emerge. When Jesus is revealed, he's revealed by who? By the Father. And then in turn, when we correctly identify Jesus for who he is, the Father reveals something about who we are. The Father reveals and validates the Son's true identity. This isn't just Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter's son. This is my Son with whom I am well pleased. And then when John correctly recognizes, behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. And, and disciples follow. And Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, says, this is the Messiah. This is who he is. What does Jesus do? 
Jesus reveals and validates Peter's true identity, right? You are Peter. You are Cephas upon this rock of a build by church. When we correctly identify Jesus, Jesus correctly identifies us. Or in other words, when you discover who Jesus really is, you discover who you really are. This is so true. In my life, I had a whole idea of what my life was going to be, and, and I met Jesus, and he revealed to me what it really was. And it, it's so much better, so much different, but so much better than anything that I could have planned myself, because my identity was based on what I think of myself or what other people said about me, but my identity in Christ is what God says about me, what's revealed to me. When I understand who Jesus really is, he helps me understand who I really am and what that means for my life. You discover who you really are and what your purpose becomes clearer. It's kind of like the voice, right? Have you seen the voice? It's kind of like the voice. I could be a contestant on the voice and I could think all sorts of things, but it's quite different when I'm validated by the experience. Here's what I mean. So there's what I believe about my singing ability. And if I stop there, I might think I'm the greatest, right? Pretty good. I sing in the shower like a champ. And I don't need anybody else's validation because I know I'm the best, right? I mean, there's, there's what I believe. Then there's people who I know or people who are closest to me. They're like, eh, you know, might want to skip the voice. Or, or, or yeah, go for it. We think you're great. You've got a voice. But in the end, you know, when you go on a competition show like that, it's when the star believes in me that I'm really validated. It's like the higher the importance, the greater the validation, right? So there's me and then there's the people who know me and then, oh my gosh, if one of these music stars believes in me, then I know I've got it. Well, how different than that is really our understanding of who we are in Christ, right? There's what I believe about me I could believe all sorts of things, good, bad, and ugly. And then there's what other people believe about me, but what matters the most? What drives my life? What validates me? Is what does God believe about me? He believes I'm his child. I'm worth dying for. He's got a plan and purpose for me. I am part of the equation of him bringing all things back to himself. I play an important role. I'm, yes, a minor character in the great scheme of things, but it's an important character. I've got my job to do. All of my self-worth and self-value comes from what God believes about me. You know, self-esteem is a funny thing. It's like a balloon that inflates and deflates based on the littlest things that happen. But I have something called God-esteem. I remember no matter how bad I feel, I remember who I am in Jesus. And again, this is so incredibly important when it just comes to following. So, when you follow Jesus, your purpose becomes clearer. So what are the steps to following? How do I really follow Jesus and to get that understanding of who I am revealed by him? Because it does seem like it's kind of a mystery. It does seem like, well, I'm not really sure. What are the mechanics of that? How does that work? So here are the mechanics. It goes something like this. Commit to becoming a learner. By the way, that's what disciple means. It means Learner, commit to becoming a learner. If you are not in the word, if you're not reading scripture, if you're not studying it and learning it, you're missing it. There is no way you're going to be able to follow Jesus and understand who you are and effectively move forward 100% without the barriers if you never touch the Bible. And you can't just rely on me telling you or, or somebody else telling you what it is. You've got to dig in. You've got to Allow yourself to respond and hear and be transformed by the word of God. It doesn't take much. It actually doesn't take much, probably way less than you think. But it takes something. You've got to commit to being a learner. What did Jesus say? Come and you will see. Not stay there and I'll kind of drop you some nuggets of wisdom and then you'll see. Come. Following means learning. You're learning from the rabbi, the teacher. 
What's a teacher doing if there are no students learning, right? I mean, that's the point. We are supposed to be learners. And there's so many ways. Here's some ideas that you could commit to becoming a learner. So we made this easy for you. There are things that you could do on your own, like the YouVersion Bible app. There are things that we offer all the time. We offer small groups all the time. We have Bible studies going on all the time. Pastor Teresa's Bible study. You will learn and start to understand what it means to follow Jesus. Or you think about this new thing that we're doing 30 days deeper. You're going to be in, in discussion about this message, about the scripture passage with somebody else. You're committing to becoming a learner. More than that, right? The second step, you've got to surrender your heart. And this is really cultivating a lifestyle of prayer. So you're committing to becoming a learner, but you're also opening yourself up. Prayer is how you open yourself up to God on an everyday basis. What does prayer do but knock down the barriers? Prayer is the way that you clear the path and get that 15-minute parking, right? It's, it's how you make the whole process work smoother is through prayer. Why? Because you're opening yourself up to God. You're, you're constantly saying, not, not my will, but thy will be done. Prayer is also doing something else. It's reorienting you. It's making sure you're right where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there. It's kind of like this activity that we did in college. So when I was pledging my fraternity, one of the uh, rituals, of course it wasn't hazing, one of the rituals that we did was something called Four Corners, where they would blindfold us and put us, all around, went to Allegheny College, they put us in all different areas of the town of Meadville. Now, Meadville is not a huge town, but it was big enough where it, it's, that's a long way to be separated. And they blindfolded us, and they said, you had to find all of your fellow pledge classmates without seeing. You can only use the sound of your voice. And, and the only way that you could do it was to sort of chant the, uh, the fraternity chant that I'm not going to do here and now because I totally forgot it. But, but that was the only way that you could communicate. And um, now we had, you know, spotters with us and everything, so we didn't go, go way off course. But the idea was we had to listen for each other through the noise of everything in town. And hear each other not to be able to gather in one place and find each other in the midst of it all, coming from all different directions. And we did. It was amazing through all that, through, through geographic location and noise and all the things, all the challenges that were in front of us, we found each other because we were listening specifically for each other's voices. And this is not unlike what happens in prayer. You get reoriented. You get back right where you're supposed to be. If you've gone far off, if you've drifted, you come circling back because you are focusing on the sound of God's voice. This is what prayer, prayer does. This is a surrendering of your heart that has to happen every single day. This is how you follow. And then the third thing, I'll throw this in there. If you haven't already, you need to get baptized. Or to remember the promises made at your baptism. We believe in the Presbyterian church that you get baptized once, it's good. God doesn't need to re-up. But we often need to re-up on our promises at baptism, especially if we were babies when we were baptized. And the idea is we should always be thinking, all right, God, help me live up to the promises made for me on that day. Help me to follow you with my whole heart. And if you've not been baptized, I want to encourage you, talk to us. Let's do it. What is baptism? But it's a constant saying, it's constantly saying, I'm dying to the old identities and I'm embracing my identity in God, my identity in Christ. I'm dying to the self and rising in Jesus Christ. Or maybe another way of saying it is, I'm saying no to false identities and yes to who God says I am. I know this isn't necessarily rocket science, but Again, it's, it sounds easy until you start to do it. It's, it's tough. It takes work. It takes intention. I'm not promising you that following Jesus is going to be easy. These aren't just easy steps to follow Jesus. There's no such thing. But I will tell you this. There is nothing like it. There is no path that you can follow that's going to lead to greater riches in your spirit than the path of following Jesus. You will have no greater joy, no greater peace, than when you're following Jesus, no matter what's going on in your life. I know it's something that we're all chasing and it feels so elusive, but that very thing that you've been looking for is found in Jesus. 
If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be standing right here. And I also, if I haven't lived it and experienced it, I wouldn't be telling it to you now. It's true. Why not give it a shot? But remember, it's not just about listening to me talk. It's about you doing. So here's a couple of things. What does God want for me right now or for you? We have some downloadable exercises to help you think through this. So if you go onto our website, towerhillchurch.org, you're going to see where you can download some of these things. And they're going to go out in our email if you uh, subscribe to Tower Talk. And if you don't, do it because you get all sorts of information like this. But the idea is you're going to walk through it this week. And I want to encourage you to do it. Don't wait either. Right after this uh, this, uh, worship service, I want you to find it and download it so you don't forget. And then through the week, think about it. Pray on it. Add it to the rhythm of your life. And you're going to start finding out who you are. Because listen, you can't move forward into what's next for you until you know who you are in Jesus Christ. Because when you know who you are, your purpose becomes clear. When you know who Jesus is, you know who you are. All these things flow together to help you get to where God wants you to go, where he wants you to take your next move. Amen.